Okay, Robin, you're going to talk about PMLP. Yep. Uh, I hope you like the uh, okay, so our interest, as this might suggest, <laughs> is being primarily in uh, the area of cerebral workflow. So, in particular, uh, looking at uh, aneurysms forming, so hemorrhagic stroke, questions such as uh, if we detect an aneurysm, do we know whether it's likely to rupture? Do we know what kind of treatment methods we might want to use? What are the effects of using those, those treatment methods? Uh, key point here is, depending on which paper you happen to look at, you might find unruptured aneurysms in about 1 to 5% of the UK population. Um, they're typically discovered when people go for scans for other things. Um, it's very dangerous to attempt treating it, very dangerous. Rather, I mean there are risks associated with it. You don't want to do it if there's no risk of rupture. Um, so, should someone do it, and if they do, what are the risks? Um, Okay, why do we use simulation? Probably going to see this here. Uh, basically, we already have pretty much all the data that we need. Um, the, when uh, interventional radiologists, for example, uh, are, are operating, so inserting flow diverting stents to the aneurysm, they already uh, perform, for example, CT scans and so on, from which uh, these 3D geometries can be created. Um, we also have some non-invasive techniques for measuring the blood flow velocities, such as a, a transcranial Doppler. So the idea there is, if we've already got all this data, um, can we give a new interpretation or derive something useful to clinicians uh, that they can already see just from looking at the data? We're interested mainly in, the, say, for example, water shear stresses, for example, from introducing both directly. We, we also do some work in... Um, recently started doing uh, looking at magnetic drug targeting so looking at whether we can use these simulations with uh, so with um, super power magnetic iron oxide and particles so looking at we can guide these with it's, it's pretty futuristic for now it's mostly just uh, animal studies but nevertheless the idea is with this we could perhaps predict what kind of dosage to give to a patient based on a scan of their brain and some idea of what, what sort of velocity we're looking at here. Maybe we could look at how much to reach a uh, given target site. It's got a work in progress very much. The code we use is uh, email B, which is yet another uh, last post in, uh, code. Uh, but this one's uh, highly optimized for, for sparse uh, geometries, which you find a lot, obviously, in cardiovascular uh, systems. Uh, it's been running for quite a while, since about 2008. And uh, just to give an example of how sparse it can go, there's a, a mouse retina. And, uh, but although this, uh, this circle of will is here, so at the center of the brain, uh, if you look at that about 10 micron resolution, you'll find that the fluid fraction of the volume is, is far less than 0.01%. So these are absurdly sparse, and the load balancing is consequently uh, rather difficult to do. Alphonse has already kind of uh, talked about this sort of stuff, but um, just making a point that the blood flow is this very naturally very multi-scale sort of process. We typically just look at um, coupling the 1D models and 3D, but um, Hemopy does also do some dreadful stuff. So there have been some attempts to couple it to Chase recently. I bring this up because one of the things that was supposed to mark Vecma out from other UP projects was that it was treating multi-scale systems, so that there was uncertainty in the scale bridging as well. Okay, so uh, sources of error, there's far more than what I'm going to talk about here. But one of the main ones that, that we're planning to, to start looking at with Vecma is re relatively simple, which is just the segmentation of the medical images to produce the, these 3D um, geometries in which we do the simulation is naturally subject to a certain level of subjectivity from the, whichever clinician you get to do this. There are semi-automated ways of doing this, but what you get out typically has, sometimes you have artifacts, or you can't tell if they're artifacts. You, depending on which contour level you, you choose, you may resolve different vessels, and if a vessel is resolved or not resolved, even a small one can in fact give quite large deviations. So it's not clear what the predictive power of this model is if it's, if it's, if it's thrown off by small blood vessels on the side. So we need to, to look into that. Um, I mean, I, I 
but it was back in the time that his ancestors still not support her. Yeah. And he claimed like, well, you know, we can get the woman by 10% right and blah, blah, blah. But yeah. we haven't really seen, you know, a decent, let's say, estimation of true errors. In the yeah, exactly. So I think... Are you planning yeah. to do that? Just just playing him opinion and then playing with the... Quality of yeah, the, the literally. So we, we have some club in, in Qatar um, who who've been who are providing us with uh, some estimate of the, the uncertainty, the, the gradient of if you see it as a probability distribution. Yeah. distribution but, uh, we were thinking of starting with something relatively true like that, and I, I think because it was a while ago, I think now we have greater computational power. We can probably get away with the. I think it was kind of inconclusive. No, yeah, definitely. Another um, source of error is um, what I alluded to earlier. Um, how do we get the velocity profile at the inlets? Uh, one way is uh, non invasively by um, using a transcranial Doppler um, uh, measurement thing. So basically, that's not great because you can only shine it through holes in the skull effectively. So you can typically only get Losses in, for example, the middle cerebral artery by pointing it straight down from here. Um, it's kind of noisy data, but it's non invasive, probably. There, you can also do a phase contrast MRI, so I know people have issues with that. When we can't do this, we do something which I think Alfon kind of mentioned earlier, which is you, you can use a, a 1D model of the periphery or the whole body if you have it, and use that to create your input condition. But obviously, there's a there's a source of error in, in this here as well, and uh, then there's uh, what I'm calling scale bridging, which is if you've got the one D profile, the peak velocity at an inlet, um, you then have to generate that two dimensional profile at the inlet, and depending on the concavity or irregularity, this can have an effect. You're also not capturing, for example, uh, vents that are upstream. You might not even know if they're there, so you kind of So these are so. Sort of off the top of my head, really, three different sources of error. There are others, such as the banker condition at the outlet, for example, which is actually quite a big source of contention, it turns out. Um, so here's a, a paper that we worked on. So sorry, <coughs> maybe one, what yeah. I realized in discussions a week ago is that a big source of error in this one deep model is the actual energy rate in the vessel itself. Right. Because this is extremely, I mean, as you go to smaller and smaller vessels, the energy rate is changing widely. And of course, the quality of that and the diffusion is directly related to viscosity, which is linked to the mm -hmm. limit of it. And then have you, have, you have these famous parameters in these comedy models that all assume the fixed limit of it. This yeah. is nonsense. So that would be kind of interesting to, to dive into that as well. Look at that, especially with the selling of resolving the individual cell. Um, something we looked at recently, this is purely continuum, but it, it was um, measuring these uh, inlet velocity profiles in a patient who has an aneurysm, uh, simulating the blood flow using those uh, inside the middle of the artery for that same patient, uh, and just looking whether we even get something vaguely uh, correct looking out. Uh, we also looked at, for example, uh, changing the rheology model. A lot of people rather absurdly use Newtonian, <laughs> including us. So. Um, but we tried it with, for example, shear thinning uh, reality models instead, and found that basically when it's in the laminar regime, typically it doesn't really matter that much. But if you go into, say, mixing regime, which you, you do get, say, Reynolds number of four or 500, which, which you can get, for example, in middle cerebral artery, with full speeds of about 1.5 meters a second in a sick patient. So it, it, it can have an effect in, in, in some cases. Uh, so this is sort of our, our first attempt to kind of bring in this looking at high sensitive model is two different things, looking at resolution and so on. Um, but we'd like to do it more systematically now, and that was a, a good place to, to do that. Um, we've also, so this is, this is relatively common technique, but we've, we've also started with the same collaborators, uh, looking at 3D printed silicon phantoms to <coughs> do also in vitro uh, validation. So obviously from this you can get quite a lot more information if you believe that this is a good model of of human cardiovascular system. Here's a much more horrendous looking one. That's actually the circle of limits. It just looks insane. And in that, people use a fluid that mimic blood. Uh, again, <laughs> does it actually work? So 
But anyway, so, so this is another source of uh, validation data that we can use. Um, a final thing about Beckman is that it also uh, was supposed to, to tackle the idea of not just running on the, the current petascale scale systems, but looking at uh, models which are very large and whether we have any differences when we go up to what we're calling the exascale, but which may fall short of that and, and instead, instead be replicas that run on an exascale machine. Um, we've been doing quite a bit of work uh, on, on scaling up our, our models. Um, so this is just a circle of Willis uh, at something like 7 micron resolution. On Blue Waters, we've been getting relatively good scaling up to about 256,000 cores, but we're looking at trying to get efficient ways of doing that and, and, and looking at fixing the load balancing, which is the, the real killer of when, when you've got those levels. You don't simply want to just increase the system size, which you can do. Obviously, it's easy to get good scaling if you just increase system size, but the idea is to have it at sufficiently low fluid size that this will still complete in, say, 10 hours or 24 hours, uh, rather than just you know, hammering 10 billion fluid size on each core and then going with the scaling. The reason we want to do this is, uh, Again, as I'll come back to you mentioned earlier, uh, we're, we're looking at the uh, filament arterial tree. Uh, we quite like to, to get some simulations in here um, in order to, 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 uh, to, for example, validate whether these 1D models are working. But they are working, but in which cases do they work? Maybe we can do something on the matter grid as well, perhaps. This just gives you an idea of how absolutely massive this is. Here, the sort of typical simulations we do. Here's one that's a bit larger, seven centimeters. That's this tiny bit here. Uh, human body's huge. Um, I would not going to go through all these numbers, but the point is basically, even creating this system is a massive pain. Yet. And it creates huge files, takes ages to do every step. Um, and, and the simulation itself is naturally also quite intensive. So uh, I think it goes without saying that, you know, crude quasi Monte Carlo approach to insert computation such a system is insane uh, and unlikely to, to work out for you. So maybe we look at some side in our library. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
in segmentation, in velocity, scale bridging, God knows it's a ton of other things as well. Um, we, we've had some uh, experience so far in, in validating against in vivo uh, measurements and in silk convention. So in, in vitro, we'd like to continue that. I don't know how the validation element will be implemented in Tibet, but we've got some ideas for it tomorrow. Uh, so we'll discuss that again. Um, and uh, that, mm -hmm. yeah, doing the UQ for models which are very expensive is, uh, is obviously um, going to require us to think about it a bit more. Um, although I think that Adam kind of touched on that. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Somebody's